What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. Today, Mike, we are talking about Season 2, Episode 9, Second Sight. Yes, we are. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this with you because I think, uh, we talked a little bit beforehand, you and I have very differing views on this episode. Yeah, I was which, sort of shocked when you said what you said. I'm I'm sort of excited to uh, to have this discussion moving forward because we almost always agree, and how boring is that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this should be interesting. Uh, how's it going, Mike? It's going well, Keith. I we can talk about it on a different show we have, but it's been a great week to be a Philadelphia sports fan. That's uh, true, sports ball. It's playoffs. If you're not a sports ball person, you should be because every sport is going right now. All of the major sports are firing away. Uh, it, we're climbing poles. We're uh, Philadelphia is celebrating. I've been. Uh, it's been great. The thing I would like to ask all of our people out there, Keith, and I, I feel a little silly saying it, but I think I think it's it's worth pushing. We, you know, Keith and I have been working on this channel for a while now it's not it doesn't bring us money per se we do it because we love it and that's that's true but we're approaching a milestone which is a thousand subscribers it is so minuscule in the grand scheme of youtube channels right there, there i mean i look at i sleep to a white noise channel at night sometimes and they have hundreds of thousands we're of not subscribers. even a bug on the windshield no. of most youtube channels but we have grown this completely organic Glanically, no Google AdWords, none of that. And we just, we'd love to see that 1,000. So if you haven't subscribed and you are tuning in, we ask you, please throw us a subscription. Maybe even tell a friend, hit the bell so you can know when we get, we put all our new nonsense up. We've got a new show. And in, in addition to that, we have a Patreon, which uh, you can join. Keith, would you like to uh, tell the people what I they would get? sure yeah. love to. Uh, yeah, help us get to 1,000 subscribers so your experience can be worse because we're going to put ads on it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> the truth. Anyway, uh, our Patreon is where the fun stuff happens, and there are no ads, even in the future. Uh, you can find it at patreon.com slash K and M, uh, and you can get bonus episodes. You can watch Mike watch the episode. You can literally watch the episode and watch Mike as he watches it. It's super fun. We have AMAs, bonus episodes. We're chatting up with you. We'll uh, we have a really good time up there, and uh, you can join these fine folks: Brian Kaufman, Casey Clark, Cloudlover69, Jason Mo, Jorge Navoa, and the mysterious, the mysterious Anne Worf's Bootshivs, Charles Nivens, Alan Zimmerman, CRM Productions, Charles Babbage, and at Grim Toys. We appreciate each and every one of you, and uh, come and join the team. Be a patron. If not, just throw us a like, a subscription, tell a friend. That's all of that stuff. Yeah, all that fun stuff. So uh, I, I'm excited to dive into this. So let us talk a little bit about the world surrounding Second Sight, which aired on November 21, 1993. And we were, of course, listening to, once again, a flawless rendition of Meatloaf's greatest hit. And I would do anything for love. But I won't do. <laughs> you know, Keith, uh, we have a friend who writes into the show uh, who does not like listening to us sing. In fact, no. this just in, he said he said an audio clip of what it sounds like uh, on his end of his speakers mm -hmm. when when mm -hmm. we sing. Yeah. Wow. He, he, I mean, uh, we were clearly identified as I'm Quark and you're Rom. So no, that is I don't very know much I feel appropriate. About that. How do I feel about that? <laughs> I feel seen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Mike, Mike and his soundboard, uh, he's got about another week before we take it away from him. <laughs> but you know what we can't take away from him? The memory of seeing Adam's Family Values, which was the top movie this week week mike just watched it this week did not know i just it was on abc family so i watched it you really yeah I, well, not I only mean, that i watched the original adam's family and adam's family mm -hmm. values well to be fair you just spent the summer playing gomez adams I in did. the musical mm -hmm. so so there it is you you have some uh you have some relationship with it uh all right so uh Obviously, we we were listening to Meatloaf and going to the movies, but uh, if we were to go back and check the VCR, what did we tape that night? 
Uh, we were taping Lois and Clark. Uh, we were taping of Murder, course. She Wrote, uh, Killing in Cork. We were taping, let's see, Martin, Living Single, Married with Children. Man, Fox was nailing it. And, of course, that I still don't know what Sequest DSV was. I'm going to have to Google that. How do you not know it? I mean, everyone else on the channel is like, Mike, what the hell? Sequest DSV was, uh, it was, it was Roy Scheider from okay. Jaws. Okay. Leading a, f it's set in the near future, sort of in a post-apocalyptic world. And he, and they're driving around in a fancy submarine, basically doing like underwater Star Trek. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so two questions on what was on TV, and you can you can probably answer for me, Keith, because I don't remember. So at this point here in 93, America's Funniest Home Videos was airing at 7 o'clock, so before primetime. My question is, eventually it moved up to the 8 o'clock slot. At this point, did it had it not moved up yet, or had it moved back down? Because mean... 8 o'clock, their primetime was Lois and Clark, but I remember America's Funniest Home Videos being the, the 8 o'clock special. I think it was 7. I, I really do. Um, because huh. I because we watched it religiously, right? And and uh, my father thought Bob Saget was the funniest person in God, the world. I loved it too. I loved it too. And uh, so we'd watch America's Funniest Home Videos. And then everyone else would go upstairs, and I'd watch Lois and Clark because I have taste in class. So final question: So ABC mm. and NBC both at nine p.m. ran their. Uh, so ABC was ABC Sunday Night at the Movies, and then NBC Sunday Night Movie. Uh, were those? Were those second-run movies, or were they produced for those channels? I don't remember. Because we had, on ABC, JFK, Reckless Youth, part one of two. I I feel, I mean, obviously that was a a uh, TV movie. Yeah. And then NBC I, was, the Sunday night movie was A Family Torn Apart, 1993. Yeah, they must have been They must they have must been TV, been TV movies. movies. Yep. Wow. Remember when those were a thing? <laughs> uh, Barely. And then on CBS, at 9 p.m., do you know what aired? This is kind of crazy. And this night, a Walton Thanksgiving reunion. The Waltons ah. had a TV reunion in 1993. Mm. There you go. There it is. Well, that's another one of my fav my father's favorite shows yeah. from back in the day. And you know, so. the Waltons is actually a good a good sort of surrogate for this episode because there's some. I think you would have to agree, even if you didn't love the episode, Keith, which is what the inkling I'm getting that we had some good father son moments. Which oh the for Walton, sure the Waltons yeah. were, were pretty good with. No, no, that we definitely have. But before we do that, um, we, we, we've we've done all the soft news. It's time to hit some hard news, it's Mike. It's time. It's time. Uh, and this is a good one. I'm excited about this. We have uh, our weekly world news for today. And most of it comes down to Dead Sea Scrolls revealing the future. And boy, we have some really important things that happened in the future. Uh, the uh, blockbuster predictions include Wow, Russia, these are crazy. Russia becoming America's 51st state, which kind of happened. <laughs> that is not so weekly world newsy, is it? Yeah, that's that's like, oh, shit, maybe we should go back and look at these Dead Sea Scrolls because that's definitely true. However, Hillary Clinton was not elected president in three years, uh, but they were definitely intertwined. Um, I, I, I think it was like either or. Like, either Hillary Clinton will be president or Russia will become the 51st state. And definitely one of them happened. Uh, there were 50 chilling prophecies um, that have already come true. So that's super exciting. Also, topically, for the Halloween season, a new horror movie scares 31 people to death. Keith, I got to so, tell you something real quick. Mm. Today's the 24th when we're recording this. Uh, the episode will drop on the 26th. But on the 25th, Keith, that's tomorrow for you and me. Barbarian airs on HBO Max. Another movie, uh, like a, it was a sleeper horror hit uh, that we're supposed to know nothing about going in. We're supposed to be unsullied. I think we okay. should watch it tomorrow and maybe maybe chat about it. All right, all right, that sounds good. Yeah, I, spooky I was, season, uh, y'all. I I watch a lot of spooky seasons. You can watch our entire ninety minutes on the Halloween series that we did on K and M Geekly. All right, so let us zero in on this episode of Deep Space Nine, which was directed by Alexander Singer, who directed six episodes of Next Generation, six of Deep Space, Mi Deep Space Nine, and ten of Voyager. Uh, a veteran director had started directing, I think, back in 1951, but okay. uh, did a lot of Trek. And this episode was written by Mark O'Connell, who wrote four episodes of Deep Space Nine, Ira Stephen Bear, and Robert Hewitt Wolf, with a story by Mr. Mark O'Connell. 
Do you think it's time to maybe do some uh, some trivial trivia, Mike? Let's do it. Now there it keep is. waste your time with trivial trivia. That could have gone bad. It, it certainly, I mean, uh, disastrous. It could have been disastrous <laughs> <laughs> because our standards are so high. Oh, we streamlined this week, though, baby. Yeah, we did. <laughs> All right, so the first piece of trivia is the terraforming technology here in this in this episode is based on the Genesis device from Star Trek III, um, which was a big part of the movie series. This episode was originally written to be a Bashir episode. Really? With him looking for the disappearing lady. Okay. But uh, Bashir already got some this episode or this season, so uh, he's he's busy. He's good. He's good for a while. Uh, I think it was a good change. It was a great change, I think. Sayatik's quarters were built from the aft section of the runabout they used for Timescape. So, uh, of of The Next Generation. There's a great episode of Next Generation which takes place on a runabout. And in it, we see the the aft section, which has a a big open area with a conference table and like they're having dinner. So, the, the runabouts are bigger than I think it seems like on the uh, on the show but it is interesting that they didn't keep it they decided to uh well i guess they, they certainly can adapt it and readapt it um but uh, that's why we get some federation looking rooms the uh, prometheus bridge which is uh you know dr fancy pants's ship is a redress of the excelsior bridge from star trek 6 uh, which is one of the reasons that it looks so terrific because it was built for the movie is it me? And or is do those fly? Do they have like a, a autopilot? Is that how that works? They have that huge ship, and there's only two of them on it. No, they have a whole. It's a Federation ship. They've got a whole, got a whole crew. Oh, it's it's weird because doesn't Odo say or later on he's like I didn't see anybody but what's his bucket on that ship. No, only what's his bucket left the ship. Oh, oh gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Which is weird because they had a Federation crew. They wouldn't allow him to go to the promenade. Those hollow scoops sh- were empty. I know. That's it, 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 missed opportunity, folks. And finally, Sayatik's personality is based on Hollywood director John Houston, Angelica Houston's father. Uh, I've heard many of interview with his children, and this all sounds pretty accurate to, uh, to uh, famous director John Houston. So next, we talk about what was Next Generation doing? And this was had an interesting wrinkle here that I hadn't thought about until I saw this. Uh, Next Gen was doing the episode Inheritance uh, about a woman arriving claiming to be Data's mother. And it's uh, Fiona La Flanagan who played the widow Dax was hooking up with in the episode Dax. But I, for the life of me, would have guessed that Inheritance was done first before Dax, but actually it was reversed. She got the gig for this because of the performance. I'm assuming that she did a great performance in the episode Dax. So uh, there you go. So the guest stars this week include Sally Elise Richardson as Fena slash Nadell. And Mike, I'm curious if you know who this person is who plays Sayatik. It's Richard Kiley. Now, do you know why Richard Kiley is uh, is relevant to our lives? He was in a musical? Uh, not only was he in a musical, he was the original Don Quixote oh. in Man of La Mancha and would revive that role on Broadway several times. To dream. To dream. The impossible dream. You know, it, it, maybe, maybe we're going to take that away from you like earlier than a couple of weeks. <laughs> no, it's all mine, baby. I have to, I have to uh, justify the investment. <laughs> How much did that cost? <laughs> Let's move forward. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, more I don't than think, the pen, Keith. More than the pen. I don't think Jen listens to this one. <laughs> No. I think you're okay. <laughs> oh, I actually, I have a little trivia, trivia myself. Okay. And uh, in, along with the theme of this episode, I'm going to pat myself on the back, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, much like this cat that our, or one of our, our pro, 
protagonists. Um, I don't really know. He's kind of good and bad. You know, mostly mostly bad. It's yeah. John Houston. Yeah. Anyway, so I was attending a watch party for our Philadelphia Phillies last night, and uh, someone mentioned that they were listening to our our Deep Deep Space Nine podcast. A uh, friend of friend of mine. Really, I, <laughs> that face was the exact one I made. <laughs> Because they love Deep Space Nine, and so they're doing a rewatch, re-listen with us. No kidding. Yeah, and... Well, welcome. Thank you, mysterious friend. My friend's partner was like, oh, did you get to the Dominion Wars yet? And I said, "I'm let me stop you right there. <laughs> yeah, you're damn right. I don't know what you're talking about, and I'd like you to stop talking about it. A million percent. Shut so, up. I want everyone yeah. to know that I've remained on Sully, although apparently there's some wars we're in for, so... They also well, mentioned a romance... That I don't know if they meant it was an actual romance or if they're just talking about the characters' chemistries. So I'm, I'm hesitating to even say what it is because it could be a spoiler. But I, I don't know. Well, it also could be. It also could be a one episode nothing. So. Well, yeah. They they mentioned an, a potential Kira Odo thing. Is that a? a Keith. I, I'm not I telling you I was shit, like, man. There's no way that they have a romance, but maybe. Like who? Well, anyway, tell your friends. Uh, thank you so much. Shut for, up! Thank you so much for watching the show. But uh, if if you spoil any more of Deep Space Nine for Mike, I will come to your house and slap you. <laughs> but thanks for listening. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think it is long past time to hop into the screening room and talk about Second Sight. So sorry. Just it just so gets sorry. worse. It gets worse. <laughs> All right. So in our teaser here on Second Sight, we hear Cisco's personal log. It's the fourth anniversary of Wolf 359 and his wife's death. Jen. Uh, Jen? Oh, oh, it is Jen. <laughs> I was thinking, because you, your wife's name is Jen. Oh, no, that's probably not the... No, well, it's context, Keith, because my wife has, uh, I don't know, I think I, meant, I mentioned it on the watch along at least. My wife is out of town for like three months. I'm only seeing her once a week, and so I'm a little wistful, and so I was in the proper, exact proper emotional state for this episode. Uh, yeah, no, fair enough. Jake wakes up in the middle of the night and they discuss a nightmare that Jake had. He's had an anxiety dream about trying to find his father. It's kind of heartbreaking and it's a great scene. Yeah, except for his PJs. Except for his PJs. Well, you know, most of contemporary clothes on Star Trek already looks like PJs, but the PJs themselves are extra. Uh, but I think it's a great, I think it's a really good scene. Um, and it uh, adds... Adds depth to this episode, which is very appreciated. Uh, also, we learned that Jake is taking calculus at 15. Well, he's uh, very emotionally intelligent. Might as well he's smart, too. Look, I am this many years old, and I have never taken calculus. So I know, uh, my, I know my calculus. It, it says you plus me equals us. Did you just write a new song on the fly? No, that's from an incredible... An incredible MTV, made for MTV movie called Together, but spelled to get her. It was like a, it was a, a spoof on boy bands. It is hysterical, starring uh, Chris Farley's brother. Oh, okay. It well, is I mean, incredible. Folks, okay. you heard it here, folk. First, go on YouTube and find To Get Her. Uh, starring, uh, I'm going to see if I can find that single for you, Keith. Go ahead, continue. Wow, okay. that's We are getting some new information today. But uh, after the, the scene that I thought was, you know, the good one in the episode, Cisco walks on the upper level of the promenade at night. And he's met by a pretty woman wearing a very fancy red dress. Turns out her name is Fena, and they are vibing immediately. I was vibing too, buddy. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't blame you. Uh, they take a stroll. She's sad because she has to go soon, but doesn't say where. Cisco tries to ask her out, but then, poof, she has disappeared, like most of the women I've ever asked out. 
So, uh, and that is our teaser. Have you found our, our hit single yet? Uh, I believe so. Let's see if, uh, if it'll play for us. Okay, let's, let's hear it. It's you plus me equals us. Oh my god. It breaks down. We together. Wow. <laughs> wow. Guys, I can't recommend it any higher. <laughs> I'm really surprised I didn't write that. <laughs> it's got a key vibe. It's got a key vibe. It's very much in my in my wheelhouse. So uh we begin act one, and O'Brien is back from filming his movie. He's battling the station as he makes repairs. There are sparks and smoke, and uh, it, it doesn't seem safe. Mm. I, I think uh, you have an electrical problem. If you're seeing sparks and smoke, you should probably call an electrician. Uh, but it's it's high comedy on Deep Space Nine. But Cisco, you know what? He's in a great mood because he's got the flutters for Fenna. Mm-hmm. He's got some sparks and smokes himself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you think that's <laughs> we go back one? That that's not O'Brien's pants. That's Cisco's pants making all that. <laughs> Cisco is thirsty. Yes, indeed. Whoo! Somebody put out that fire. He tries to put out that fire with some tea. And Kira wonders why he's not drinking his standard Roctagino. Yeah, number one, this whole scene, she's setting up this joke. Or a joke. She's setting up this beat where she's like, I recognize. They all know something's up. I mean, he's he's, he's not being subtle about it, let's be honest. But uh, the whole time I thought she was, I really, where I thought it was going, she's like, you know, for months you come in while we're all working, you're drinking your Roctagino. Never once did you offer me one, you son of a bitch. I thought that's what she was going to say, but she does it. She just recognizes that, she's got something going on. That would have been funnier, but, it, you know, in reality, what's happening here, right? We're saying, like, oh, something's different with Cisco, right? But really what we're doing is making sure that everybody has a scene. Right. But they 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 put their foot on that, on the Rock the Gino thing, so hard for so long, and it means nothing. It's literally just we need to give Kira some lines. She's like, I'm really concerned. You know, every day you come and it's like this big dramatic scene and it's absolutely nothing. It oh, I just nothing. thought it gave a chance for for uh, Avery here to uh, just kind of like float in and make some. I, yeah, I have no, to, for I'll, sure. to say this about Avery Brooks. I, we've talked about it before. But I'm going to, he doubles down here. Every time, like Keith, if I was like, Keith, give me like a smoldering, like I have a crush kind of couple, some B roll. Yeah, that's like what you would do. <laughs> Avery Brooks, no. He's like, Avery Brooks is like when you take the take at the end of like doing five takes of a scene and they're like, just eh, give me something off the, give me something like just off the radar, something crazy. And they always use that take for him. Always. Well, that's part of what makes him so compelling. Like you literally don't know what he's going to do next. Uh, And it makes the character pretty interesting. Yeah. So uh, after way too long about Rock the Gina, which goes nowhere, Dax calls and invites them to come to the science lab to meet with a Professor Sayatek. He's a terraformer, and he's chilling in the flux generator. And apparently terraformers have big personalities. I need your your, uh, your reverb for that. Terraformation! Terraformation. Domination! Domination. So he exits the strobe machine. But he's also an artist, right? That's what we're saying. He, he does many things. He's, he's got a lot of talents. Uh, but he, uh, he, he saunters in and removes his ridiculous sperm hat. And he's got a lot of energy for a. He's a very confident fellow. And now he's a fencer. He's a fencer. He's he's sort of like a Broadway producer who you know is going to turn out to be full of shit with. But, but you work with him because you've got no other prospects. Uh, Whew. <laughs> Ooh, <we're a> <laughs> where, deep cut. Where everybody's wearing their heart on their sleeve this episode. <laughs> <laughs> he explains he's got a new plan to reignite a dead sun. Because that's a and, thing you can do. Uh, it is on Star Trek. You know, so there you can reignite my my dead heart. So it might as well. Uh, and this is going to be his crowning achievement. So uh, later. 
over Andorian Tularoot, Dax and Cisco chat. And Dax can tell that Cisco's a little distracted. But she reminds us that uh, if the experiment to reignite the star fails, it will go supernova and uh, and blow up everything. Exactly. So they're they're super they're uh, they're they're making sure the ship can get away. And of course, it's Chekhov supernova. So keep an eye out for that yeah, later. Yeah, really. Also, okay. Here's a little trivial trivia for you, Keith, but it's a little bit more uh, subjective. Okay. More ridiculous and egregious. The just. Nonstop techno babble on the show, or the nonstop culturally techno food babble. Oh yes, they they can never just like eat a burger. Yeah, it's like it's all this. <laughs> it's and it's specific. I've uh, got to get a floop stoppy and omelet. Oh, okay, yum. <laughs> like we should be in on that joke, but I don't know what a floop stoppy and omelet is. But I guess it's hysterical. Well, I mean, you at know, at least at least. Klingon food is funny because it's just worms. In fact, Jake has a whole monologue about that in this episode, and it's actually funny. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's it's weird because, like, later on Voyager a little bit and on Enterprise, they do address, like, wanting normal food. Okay. And, and it feels very like, oh, wait, <laughs> these are people. It's, but, you know, look, you have, you have an opportunity to, you know, invent ridiculous food. You're going to take it. You're a prop you, guy. You, you don't want to just... and You got anything else? What else you got for me? I well, all right. There's a there's a Flaxonian rice. <laughs> Hilarious. Anyway, so uh, then, without clearing his dishes, they all just sort of just walked away. Uh, Cisco wanders around, hoping to bump into Fena again, and she shows up, and she wants uh, to take him up on his offer to tour the station. So when she's like, he's like, what do you want to see? And she goes, there's like, beat, beat, beat. And she goes, everything. everything. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that I, I did not necessarily take it that oh, way. But maybe that's, I took that's it where that you're way. headed. <laughs> well, we knew you were going to take it that way. Well, you don't wear uh, that shirt. Yeah, no. Without I mean, some, a, without some subtext. That there was. Hey, look, she can wear whatever she wants, but but yes, there's there, there's some subtext there for mm -hmm. with, that, with that question. Yeah, I mean, we can all see his astro projection. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm something like that. Later, <laughs> boo. They stare out a window down at the station from an upper pylon. Look at her. And they ears. decide That's to have. Cool. A, That's a cool design. The whole her whole design is cool. It looks. Uh, uh, looks looks familiar. It, it it's it's a very similar design to um, uh, for Voyager um, of the uh, forget forgot the name of the species. Whatever. Uh, so they decide to have a picnic here later. They're still vibing a lot, but she's still vague about herself and what her deal is. And when pressed, she runs off abruptly again. I did love that uh, that visual effect there. Like the the shot of the station down from the upper pylon, yeah, like that's cool. re that's really cool. Um, anyway, so uh, poof, she disappears once again when he asks, you know, what your deal is, and this time she literally like she just runs, runs. Away. yeah. She, I was waiting for her to like leave a shoe behind. I was like, it's a little on the nose, but no, he didn't do it. And and looking back on, looking back on this again, right from the, f understanding the end of this episode. Spoiler alert for a 30-year show you 100% have already seen. Uh, I have so many questions, Talk about wormholes, about if she doesn't know who she is, why is she running? If she doesn't know who she is, why is she pretending that she does? If she doesn't, like... I, it's it's weird. That's direction, right? So that's that's bad. that's poor direction. She's given. She's doing what she was told. But you have a point there. Like you would think she, uh, uh, the the proper I think verb as a director would have been hers. Let's play some confusion, right? She should not know. She should be confused whenever those questions come up. It, she seems. Well, it's just like she, what what are the rules? What are the, what are the rules for this projected person? Right. Well, and like what's happening on the flip, right? Are they having dinner down in the uh, Prometheus and all of a sudden she's like, <laughs> she, she like, I mean, she like strokes out while she's projecting. 
I mean, I think it happens when she's asleep. <laughs> but Not maybe. always. Yeah. She's like, she's like on the toilet. She's like, like, so for tonight, gone. we're going to have a, a, a schlumaki and souffle. And I think I've got a. <laughs> oh, my God. That screenshot out of context is now the end of your career. <laughs> but he's here for it. That hard to get. He's like, yeah, keep running. Yeah. I, just, I have so many questions about the rules. <laughs> anyway. So, uh. Then, uh, in Act 2, Jake and Ben have dinner together. Cisco is distracted. Jake asks if he's in love. And Nog told him the signs of being in love. And uh, Jake just gives him the green light, which is kind of a bigger deal than they play it. I and don't I think so. I think it's. I think the way Avery Brooks plays it actually is really subtle and beautiful, as a matter of fact. I think it's well, really grounded. I, I, I think really it's grounded. played. No, I, I mean, I think the performances are terrific. I just think that that the, you know, and I've never been in the situation, right? But like to give a parent the green light to move on from your other parent, that's a, that's kind of a big moment. Yeah, but he saw him sad in the teaser and he's seeing him happy here. I mean, the juxtaposition, <laughs> Mike's cutting really, uh, r really subtle and uh, I, I'm just saying if half of the episode were about that, this would be a much better episode. Uh, I would agree that this is this, uh, when I saw this scene, I thought that that's kind of what the, the general thesis of the episode was going to be. And that does get a little bit. It's too easy. It's too easy for Jake. We don't focus. We don't focus a bit on it. It's And and like, it's too easy for Jake. Right. He's just like, yeah, yeah whatever, go for it. Like. I disagree. I, I don't think, but I think that it shouldn't be so easy for both of them. Right, I, I think one of them should at least be struggling a bit yeah. with it. But it's no, totally. but it turns out that's not really what it's about. <laughs> ultimately, no, it's, so because it's yeah. not about what it, not about the interesting possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's whatever. So uh, Jake wants to meet her, but Cisco explains explains she keeps disappearing. Sarah Lofton gives an amazing "your delusional dad." She just doesn't like you, face. Yeah, he's great. Uh, he's really good. I mean, he is especially for such a young actor. He's able to do. I just think with, they write him really well too. Yeah, and and he's he's just able to convey a lot with facial acting. It's it's good stuff. I had said in the in the first scene, and then in the teaser scene, and then in this scene in my watch along, my observation, and and maybe it's a little, maybe I'm giving too much credit for this, but you know, I thought it was cool even in '93. Here, it, you don't get a lot of single parent dad being head of the table, uh, good relationship, father-son kind of stuff that I can remember. This this is just yeah. really, it's not over the top. It's not overwritten. It's really subtle. They clearly love each other. There's no, like, other uh, kid being abandoned by his parent. It's just, like, really wholesome in a really well, grounded and I, way, and I think it works a lot. And, and I, I know that Avery Brooks has spoken about how important it was for him to show this type of relationship on television because you you know you didn't see a lot of great fathers of color on television at this point and examples of that especially as a single father and i think it's you know and i you know again this is not not something that i i can speak to from personal experience but i think that representation on the screen like we've talked about before about how sometimes just representing something no, as normal is yeah. a, is is important, yeah. and he's just a great dad. Totally. He's just a great single dad going through all the shit, doing the best he can, and being fully invested and and doing a good job. So I think that's actually very important. Uh, anyway, so he heads off to uh, to meet Odo, who is giving a briefing to his security team, and there's a short range telepath to look out for. Uh, which is weird because of the, we sort of have two of them in this episode, but I liked the idea because you have, you have a, you have someone who can tell a project and then a telepath. Maybe they could have done with some other sort of superpower they're looking out for, but I do like the sort of in media res yeah. conversation we're having there. Um, and uh, Cisco arrives wanting basically to call the cops on this girl he's crushing on, but she, but she won't stay over. So, uh, he... <laughs> oh, no, I have a very important task for you. Could you s Facebook stalk this girl I'm interested in? Could you super stalk this chick? 
it, it, it's it's weird. Odo asks for the deets, and Cisco doesn't know any of them. Um, it must be hot. It looks like he's Odo's smelting, sweating in this episode. Sweating, melting. I I don't know. I mean, he's. It was a very intense meeting. Apparently, I thought maybe it was the AI upscale, but perhaps it was it on was it on the original feed as well. I well, I I'm now looking at the AI oh, upscale. Okay, Oof, which for the most part is great. There are a couple artifacts yeah. here and there, but for the most part, it looks terrific. Uh, Cisco pretends that he he thinks she's in trouble to cover for his blatant stalking because he has absolutely no reason to think she's in trouble at this point. He's, he's like... Yeah, she hasn't, just, like, vanished yet, right? She just ran away. No, she just walked away from him. He's like, this girl doesn't want to <laughs> doesn't want to make out with me right immediately? She must be in trouble. I have to call the cops. It's just being a stalker. He uh, goes to Ops, where Dax grills him on what's going on. He close talks. She's, she saw... Yes, right. She saw him and Fena on the date. And she accuses Cisco of not spilling the beans like he used to with Curzon... Cause it's hard to talk to hard to talk man to man with a woman, which, by the way, it's very much not. You just, you know, like <laughs> I, I have more, I have better man to man conversations with my female friends than I do with my male friends. Yeah, but you know what I thought was cool about this? This is a deep cut again, but uh, I have often found Keith, you and I are an example of this. As a matter of fact, some of the best man to man conversations I've had, specifically with friends who are not as comfortable having uh, emotional conversations or heart-to-heart type conversations. That's not specific to you, but it's easier to have a conversation a lot of times while throwing a ball, throwing a baseball, always. throwing a football. Always, always, always. Uh, you and I have had some great chats throwing a football in the park. I've had some great chats with friends throwing a baseball in the park. In fact, I sometimes say to, to well, I say it, it's it's been mostly to women, but it could this goes regardless of how, who your partners are. Here, play with my balls; it'll help you. Come open on up. now, I'll say if uh, I'm having trouble talking to my partner, I'll say, "Have a catch, go throw a frisbee, yeah. go throw a ball." It's it loosens it, especially specifically men a lot of times up. No, for and that's absolutely. what this scene is in a way. No, and I and I know that actually that is a, an actual therapeutic technique. I think both the engaging your body and the repetitive motion does actually help unlock all that stuff. That's I often, well, not anymore. I work from home, but when I worked in an office, I was big on uh, walk meetings. I didn't, if we were going to call a meeting, I would, we'd go for a walk. <clears throat> Very West Wing-y. Very but I, I feel the Jobs. same way. I, I, I 100% believe in that, which is why we have all of our conversations completely stationary. <laughs> I swivel my ass off. I'm swiveling, baby. Oh, I'm constantly moving. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, I could, I could never watch myself on any of these things because like I'm, I'm bobbing and rolling and twitching and snapping constantly, but you know, it's just who I am. So, uh, where are we here? She's playing with his balls. Right, right. Yes, exactly. So, uh. Keith, are you astro projecting somewhere right I, now? I am astro. <laughs> there we go. Oh, hold on. I figured I, 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 I'm, I've got a script here. Just got to find it. Hot Keith is somewhere and having an affair with, uh, with, with a, with a starship captain. Apparently, <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like me wearing that dress. Like, hey, I'm mysterious. All right, this week on. <laughs> wow. This is the episode that gets us canceled. <laughs> so, if anybody watched, if anybody cared. Uh, so later, Simitech has invited the senior staff for dinner on his ship. They technobabble for a while. He's going to go take a shuttle to a star and throw some goo into it. We uh, In the scene, we double down on how obnoxious he is. And naturally, Bashir is immediately a fangirl. And then, all, we all squeeze into a, a three by four, a four by three. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Lots of lots of depth. Then uh, his wife Nadell walks in, and oh snap! It's Fana. Dun dun dun. We uh, we begin Act Three, and they finish dinner. And Nadell asks if she doesn't uh, look at Avery act- Brooks. Sorry, look at the take here. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, Burr. So. Uh, we we, uh, we we can see that Fennet or that Nadell does not recognize Cisco. She is also very over her husband. He has them all go to another room, leaving his wife to clean up dinner by herself. Uh, and uh, Cisco hangs back and tries to talk to her. 
She has no idea who he is and doesn't remember them meeting. But when he mentions the name Fena, she clearly reacts but denies knowing anything. So what were you thinking at this point? Well, it was it was a good performance because it did it was pretty clear she really didn't recognize him. And the only thing well, I, I can I can solve the wormhole for me. Because I was going to say, the only thing is, is Ben has shown, Cisco has shown over so many episodes that he's got such a keen intellect and, and just he picks up on subtle emotional and that he would not understand, that he would, he kind of plays a little bit like he's butthurt. Uh, but truth be told, we've all had crushes. We've been, all been in those first fluttery stages and your emotions sometimes obfuscate your, uh, your n- noticing of the red flags. So it, it 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 tracks that he might. Yeah, well, you know, turning out to being married is a red flag. That's yeah, that's one of those it things. It is true. So uh, Dax and Cisco discuss what happened, and Dax says, "Like, nope, not a red flag at all. Banger anyway. Curzon would have." Yeah. Uh, I, what I do w- love that is tracking with Dax, and even this episode, is that doesn't matter what the stakes are, whether somebody's hurt, upset, injured. There's always like. There's always kind of like a goofy fun Dax is having. Dax is yeah, always well, kind of like enjoying it. And I I, th- I think that comes with the wisdom of all of those lifetimes. You've yeah. sort of seen it all. You've been through it all. You realize that all of the stakes that everybody is feeling from the when you zoom out for 300 years, like it's just not that big of a deal. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Like none of it, um, which I, th- I think is wise. I think Someone's in my old fix age. The heat in here. I know, right? Somebody fixed the air conditioning. I think that's what O'Brien was fixing. He he couldn't fix, but it's just for Odo. Anyway, n- neither one of them considers twins yet, or that her species may all be identical. But whatever, like, just none of them are like going to like obvious questions. But however, Cisco does show a lot of vulnerability, admitting this is the first time he's been drawn to someone since his wife died, uh, which is important. Odo shows up. He's found no record of the woman. Cisco says, don't bother, bother, she's on the Prometheus. But Odo says, nobody has left the Prometheus other than Dr. Fancy Pants. So uh, later, Quark brings a drink to Cisco because he's contractually obligated to be in the <clears throat> scene, uh, to be in the episode. He knows he's been stood up. He offers to talk in the bar, and it's quite altruistic for Quark. And then, of course, offers the hollow sweets. Not for free, though. Well, of course not. You know, he's a businessman. Cisco walks back to his quarters, and uh-oh, in comes Fena. Uh, and she's coming in hot. Oh, yeah. And he says, uh, I just had dinner with someone who looks just like you, but she claims to know nothing about the other version of her. And he does finally ask the twin question, and also whether she has access to laundry because she's always in the same dress. That's a nice dress, though. It's a nice dress. Great dress. He asks who she is. She dodges the question with professions of love. They, of course, start to make out. Then Fena disappears like a ghost. And Cisco reacts by leaning back into his chair as she dissolves. Like, she literally, like, becomes a ghost. And he's like, hmm... Help us, Help Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's odd, but it does take us into Act Four, where O'Brien and Dax soup up the Prometheus before they go ignite the star. Cisco shows up and decides to tag along to try to sort out the mystery. The Prometheus bridge looks fantastic. Yeah. So does the ship model, which is clearly a kit bash of the Enterprise D. Uh, but it looks great, and it looks very much in the style of the time. Um, it feels very Federation, and I, I really like that, actually. Uh, and uh, Professor Fancy Pants and Cisco talk. <clears throat> Fancy Pants says, my life is just a series of escalating triumphs. It's just like us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just a series of escalating triumphs. They quote some Klingon poetry, and uh, I, I don't know if, it, it, this is probably a quote from something not Klingon, but pity the warrior who slays all his foes is a great quote. Uh, probably Shakespeare. They end up talking about his wife, uh, Fancy Pants, and he claims 
she's in, she loves him very much. But when Cisco goes back to his quarters on the Prometheus, guess what? Boom, Fena is there. And Cisco calls Dax, then does an unnatural amount of face touching. Mm-hmm. Dax shows up remarkably quickly and tries to scan Fena. Thank God she you brought no, the, does this thing have DNA scanner, Keith? Uh, that's a tricorder. Oh, they it always all have a stuff? tricorder. Yeah. Tricorders, it's like an iPhone. It can literally do anything. Yeah, but I thought it could only do three things. Yeah, I see what I see what you're see what you're saying there. Uh, <laughs> basically, you have a soundboard of exclusively Ferengi noises. <laughs> right now, it is uh, a good good portion of it is just Ferengi noises. <laughs> just Ferengi noises. Uh, anyway, so together they go to the what is this room here? Is it a sick bay? Is it a I don't quarters? know. Is that a chaise lounge? We've talked it's about. Sh- we talked about. Yeah. Keith and I have talked about our dis- distake for disdain for chaise lounge. Yeah, she's gonna have neck problems immediately. She can't lie down. She can't whatever. It, like, what is that? And it's also sort of there in an open room by itself next to a science station. What room are they in? Oh, what is this sort supposed of to be? Every Earth doctor's office you go to, right? They stick you in that one room. It's got like one little table. It's like an ophthalmologist. It's got that one little table, and then like a. A thing. But okay. if it's a sick bay, right, why is it a chaise lounge that you can't lie down on? She has to, Look, she has to tuck her feet in and her neck up. Of what use is this piece of furniture to anyone or They're anything? Like, Guys, we need a bed. We All we got is this thing from Jennifer Convertibles. Can we just put it in the scene? Yeah, I guess so. But just don't don't have her sitting upright. We need her laying down. It's uh, like a uh, Kelly Clarkson line. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know what's going on it is with weird. that. It is weird. Uh, the original wife has passed out. And is apparently dying, probably from discomfort. So you can astral project too hard, apparently, or too long, or too. It's just if too this much. astral projection lasts more than four hours, please contact your nearest doctor. Projectipism. <laughs> <laughs> We're two dudes who do this show. <laughs> so Professor Fancy Pants sees Fena and says, "Fena." I should have known if it weren't for those meddling kids. And uh, we go to Act 5. And uh, Professor Fancy Pants is pissed. So mad. Turns out his wife is a psychoprojective telepath. And that Fena is just a projection. But if his wife keeps projecting Fena, she'll die. Which, okay. Let's just think through the logic of this. So right. it's like a species who can do this one thing. But if they do that one thing, it'll kill them. That and doesn't it, seem well evolved. It, but that, that was exactly going to be my point. Like, exa- what, what is the survival advantage to being able... I mean, I guess, like, if you're prey and you can, and you can briefly teleproject yourself somewhere else so the monster doesn't eat you. However, uh, if that projection doesn't know their projection and you can't control that projection. And also, when you project, you f- you fruts out, so you just like lying there to be eaten while the projection's like, I'm in love with you. Like, what is the purpose of this? Keith, I have a fanfic, what I believe is potentially psychobabble, technobabble fix I love this. it, great, fix it. So there is, in canon, oops, he's pressing the button. In canon, she says in the, Final scene when Cisco asks, "How long will she go back to her planet for?" She says, "For the rest of my life. I've been away too long." So I'm saying that potentially these bizarre behaviors of the astral projections only take place off-world. On-world, I think they can control their astral projections. Blah 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 blah. It works better on-world. Yes, but okay. the only reason she, because th- then you would ask, well, then why leave the world? Well. Unfortunately, a mate for life, right? So she's stuck. He basically human trafficked her. Which is why would she marry this guy if yeah, that's the well, case? Well, that's the biggest wormhole to me. That we'll have to get to that. But. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. But that, but yeah. Uh, so the uh, professor starts to panic and forgets to moderate his performance for television <laughs> rather than the stage. <laughs> he explains his wife sometimes Keith, loses. You, know, con- you forgot the old acting saying. Always act at the level of your costume. 
<laughs> the costume should inform your yes, performance. Okay, all right. Well, there it is. So he explains that his wife sometimes loses control over her abilities when she's particularly distraught. Cisco is very salty. And uh, Fancy Pants realizes that all his wives eventually hate him and leave. But his wife's species mates for life and can't leave him no matter how much she wants to. Which I, I think the implication here is that she'll die? Because, like, they mate for life in, in like, biologically they'll die? Yeah, I die, mean, like, ostensibly or, I did too, but, I mean, I mean, we knows? all say yeah. we're going to, but... But like, what is like? What yeah, is that the feels rule? like a plot point we should have introduced a little earlier and with more specificity. Keith, yeah, why I, are you now? You're making me like the episode less. <laughs> I came in, I was high on it, and now I'm thinking it doesn't make a shit ton of sense. But okay, no, it it, it doesn't. It, it's it's very like whatever. And and of course, like the the if he knows if this guy is self aware enough to know that all of my wives eventually hate me and leave. And he marries a species that will die well, if they leave? Like, what well, a selfish prick. He, well, what has the whole episode been about? No, for he's sure. He's a selfish prick, and he's he knows it. And so what better way, if, you know, like if you're Trumpian, right, and, you've, right. and you're all about bloviating, and all these, it looks bad. I don't know what that word means. It looks bad when all these people leave you, if what do you do? You buy a wife who can't leave you, or you get enough dirt on her that she can't go. Or like maybe 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 get someone from Ukraine, you know, because they, they you can't get leave. a Ukrainian who who astral projects and mates for life. I love it. I don't know what bloviate means, but I love it. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, zing. So Cisco keeps talking. <laughs> Cisco keeps talking to the horny avatar, and she continues to be clueless. It's remarkable he couldn't tell that he was dating a goldfish. She knows nothing. No. Oh. And he tries to convince Fenna to go back to the wife. There's more face touching, and then they make out more. This is very weird. Then uh, Dax calls and says that Professor Fancy Pants, uh-oh, has... Go ahead. I hate to go down this road, but it's true. I mean, uh, it didn't. She said they said she had a couple out, a couple days. I think they said they didn't say a few out. The, the the clock's not ticking that fast. If it turns out, Keith, you got a f a girlfriend, and there are legitimately no stakes attached, right? She's not real. She got no past. She got no memory. You're just gonna make out and then send her back. I feel like you got some time. Quark offered the hollow sweets up. Go on a, at least go on a Klingon hand squeezing adventure. But, but here, but here. <laughs> <laughs> hand squeezing or ear or or, or ear, Ferengi just, yeah, just whatever grab her you got, ears. Whatever you got to do, don't just like, like make out close up and then leave. But like this, ash, this projected person who knows nothing, who's just sort of horny. Like, is she even capable of consent? She doesn't even know what oh, she is or what her deal. Get with. out of here with your <laughs> consent. She's being created by a real person. Clearly, nah, on the on the chaise lounge is digging this. <laughs> I don't know. Hashtag, let's end the episode because someone's like, getting in trouble before it's all over. This is an astral projected sex doll. Like, what is the like? What is the purpose? I don't know. Anyway, uh, so Dax calls mercifully and says that Professor Fancy Pants has launched the shuttle towards the star. He's Was that part of the plan to begin with? Is that how we knew no. we had to do it? Oh, well, no, how, we were using a machine initially. But he's he was going to send the shuttle out remote. Oh, okay. To put the goo in the star and make it do its thing. But now but he's, he's going to right go out. Thing by oh. yeah. So he's going to commit suicide to free his wife and go out with a bang. Um, meanwhile, the Federation captain of the ship is so bored by all of this. Yeah, he like couldn't care less. Uh, but the effects of restarting the star are pretty great, yeah. especially with the AI upscaling. Uh, so we see you him. Fix he goes the tracking here. The tracking got a little off. Definitely hit the yeah. <laughs> we still have VHS <laughs> tracking on our future tech here. Uh, but uh, he goes. He blows up. That's a great shot. That's really cool. That looks that looks great. Um, and uh, Fena poofs away. 
And uh, so he's he says, "Let there be light." He he goes away, and so and he solves basically the like is a. I mean, the ramifications of reigniting a star to create life into a galaxy is pretty are pretty huge. No. Yeah. No, I mean it's a giant achievement. I don't know. Like, are we short on stars? Yeah, I mean it's a. I guess it's a giant achievement. But but you know, a juxtaposed against Ben losing his first girlfriend after Jen is uh, stakes are confused but his like his like fake sex doll who doesn't even know who she is so she's very real <laughs> and the uh the board the board uh captain mm -hmm. and the guy at ops who's basically the clone of the captain and ben's like super pumped about it he's like yeah he's like yeah get rid of that guy uh because maybe maybe he's got a shot with the wife after all uh we go back to the station that's a cool shot too great shot the lighting there is is terrific. Oh yeah, and then so oh we got a single tear, single tear. Then she dissolves. She's the best guest actor. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, we it, it, we good good shots of her dissolving, disappearing. And then what do we talk about in the background all the time? These I know. two awesome creatures. I saw that too, and I'm like, why can't we hang out with them? Yeah, there. It does look like they're looking directly at. Avery Brooks's man boner there, but let's yeah. Well, it's because it's it, it's still smoking and sparking. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> O'Brien needs to come there and recalibrate it. And it's this dangerous. poor this poor extra on the far left, she's like, you know what? They're in my they're on my mark. I got to walk around them. She's mm -hmm. pissed off. You don't. No see one's her looking face. at me at yeah. all. No one's had any idea because we got these crazy things going on there. Anyway, uh, Nadell remembers nothing of Cisco and Fena's. Love story. She says, thank you for, I'm assuming, convincing her husband to kill himself. I don't know what she's thanking him for. Uh, that guy was a dick. Thanks for I mean, convincing him to kill himself. I mean, she was basically held slave captive in a way. Well, I mean, yeah. Like, more than basically. So maybe she is saying thank you for convincing my husband the to kill himself. The tone of this scene is weird, though, because she also seems very apologetic for, like, not being her astral projection and for not being able to, like, be into Ben. And he's sort of, like, is there's, like, this hint of anger in it and melancholy. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah, it's it's weird. Cisco is heartbroken um, because, uh, you know, he, he can't be in love with this one. He likes some dumb and vague. Well, he's kind of mad. She's at not her. dumb and vague. And uh, she walks away, leaving Cisco sad. And uh, and that is second sight, which means there's uh it's it's time to do everybody's favorite pop quiz for Mike. And now it's time for Mike and Deglio's Star Trek vocabulary quiz. Okay, your first quiz word is terraforming oh keith that's when you use some sort of a machine that it, it requires you to be inside of a suit to change the landscape into either something more beneficial for the species living there or a piece of art right not well some of that is right we'll give you half credit all right i'll take it it's where where you you take a, a dead star or a dead planet and you make the uh, you you make the environment suitable for life or apparently for being a star. Yeah 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 yeah. That's what I said. Yeah, exactly exactly. Oh, There's no painting involved, but you know close enough. Well, it's his next... version of painting. Ah, oh, indeed, he's painting the worlds. Your next word is psychoprojective telepath. Oh my god, that is when you're a telepath who can mm -hmm. project a creature that is by all by ostensibly is physically alive but is just a projection and you do that with your mind powers now yeah. unfortunately you can't be awake at the same time it turns out you uh -huh, can't uh -huh. you can't exist both because there must be enough of yourself in there i don't know the, the machinations of not important keith no. you stroke out you make another thing it gets horny for somebody else that's not your husband right Vis-a-vis -vis psychoprojective analyzation, psychomala by Shavin and Finn. I wasn't cheating. I was a psychoprojective telepath. Yeah. The person who came out there, looked like me, was just dumb and horny. Maybe that's the whole thing is a psychoprojective telepath. Yeah. And there's somebody fritzing out. All right. I think it is time to uh, come along home, Mike. Really? Ooh. 
Okay, here we are at Quark's. Let us now see if I have broken Mike's will about this episode. And then let's uh, begin with talking about wormholes in the plot, Mike. Well, I guess upon further review, uh, they're all wormholes. It's pretty much like the whole thing is a wormhole. I guess for me, yeah. it's, you know, the the best horror films and a lot of the best and the best sci-fi, often time travel specifically, which is kind of my jam, it work best when the rules are very clear and specific. You don't always have to agree with the rules. You don't always have to understand the rules, but there should be rules and the people in the plot should know the rules. Mm-hmm. We seem to lack that a lot of that here. Uh, the rules of this, the projection are important. Does she, does she know she's a projection? Clearly not. Does she know where she comes from or have any... Spe- no, she just kind of lives in the moment. It starts when her first motive, which the only time she says it, she says, I thought I was here looking for a place, interestingly. But it turns out I was looking for a person, you maybe. So what place was she looking for? Maybe the projection was just an escape, but that brings up the other thing, like... Can you only create one projection? Because when they say the name of the projection, the the bloviator knows exactly who they're talking about. So this person's come up before. Has he met the projection? Actually, the, I think so. Yeah, the history of the projection is kind of interesting. I would have liked to learn more about that, but we don't get a lot of that. And so, uh, so that's like a major plot hole. The other plot hole, wormhole for me is like, what's who? What is this guy like? What is the whole thing with the terraforming? Like, uh, is the 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 sun thing? Are we doing it? Is it important? Is it is it just a, a MacGuffin to get us into the plot? Like, is it? I I I, I think it's it's basically it, it is primarily a MacGuffin. Basically, we just needed to have somebody who was famous and pompous and wildly successful and terraforming stars, something big, giant scale. I mean, he's a he's a developer. Yeah, and and for me then I guess the last thing is what is the episode r- about, right? <laughs> because it really seems like they're setting up a kind of a really move pretty awesome point I was really here for, which is when is it okay to move on? Can you totally. move on? Do you especially as a parent, especially as a in a like like he's given an opportunity and 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 it almost could still work as is, Keith, with all of the issues. But we're missing that scene. If they had just replaced the scene like with Jake later, like if he had had that dinner with Jake at the end of the episode and they kind of recapped what had happened and Ben's a little melancholy and Jake's like, no, it's okay. You learned that you're ready to move forward. We have an episode, I think. Uh, Yeah. But but in the absence of that, I'm left with the what was this about and who was it for? Uh, It was cool. There were some cool bits. The ideas are cool, but it it just seemed a little – much like my Rock to Chino, Keith. Uh, if, mm. when, if, much like me without my Rock to Chino in the morning, uh, I just a little. I, I feel left feeling a little empty. Yeah, I mean, God, the I, I think the terraforming part is is a is a great like set piece to like to put this on. But the actual story, there aren't. There's not enough worm to have holes in the worm. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and like the idea of someone in an unhappy marriage, because like, like what is your psychoprojective telepathic thing? Really? It's, it's the second account you have on Facebook under a different name. (laughs) She's essentially like catfishing Benjamin here. And like, so I get it. And and I get like, you know, coming up with a sci-fi version of stepping out on your marriage and like, but fine. Right, but like the the lack of agency and the lack of awareness and rules of like what does she know, what does she not know? How dumb does Cisco have to be to ignore to to not pick up that she she's a goldfish? She doesn't know anything. Wait a second, I have another one. Okay, that this one is maybe you can like it, it doesn't make any sense because he, okay, so the species that can do this, okay. If 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 there are psycho projective species, that means that they can actively do this. They are in control of, in some sort, in some way, control of it. Right? We think uh, maybe. Well, you assume so because didn't he say she promised him it would never happen again? 
Right. So that must that that tells me that she she at least feigned that she had some ability to control it, and yet. She doesn't remember the projection. The projection doesn't remember her. There seems to be Oh, no she remembers connection. the projection though. She she knows who Fena is. Yeah, but she doesn't have any knowledge of what the projection does. But no. but, but ostensibly, she should be the one controlling it or maybe she's not she can't control it, she can only create it. I uh, well, I mean, it, I think it is it's a manifestation of her subconscious, right? This much we know. Like it is her her subconscious horniness creating another Facebook profile. You know what would have been, sorry, let me, let's write another episode. What would have been better, forget the love thing, how about he runs into this character that's like, help me, I'm trapped, I'm being held prisoner. That would make so much more sense. Yeah, and then then and then it's more of a mystery, it's intrigue. Okay, Emma, well, it's not the episode, so. Well, I mean, or, or even if it is, all right, let's say it is a projection of her subconscious, right? Which I, I think that's what it's supposed to be. There's a much more interesting way to tell that story. And it's not, it's just, it's it's a bunch of gobbledygook that they didn't, it's half-baked. All of the logic of this is half-baked. All of the, they, they don't know what they're trying to say. They don't know why they're trying to say it. They don't know how they're trying to say it. It's It's just sort of, they want to have a love story with a reappearing, disappearing lady. And they wrote a like spec, and then they filmed it. And they just a, tons, so many missed opportunities. All right, uh, the worm Let's go to best moment, and then we'll talk about the whole thing. Um, I actually really liked the scene, the second scene. I like the initial. I like the teaser with Jake and Ben because it sets up what could be a really cool episode. And I really like the second scene with Jake and Ben because it, like I said, it, it it captures all that sort of wholesome feelings and really grounded experience. I don't have either about like telling my single parent. You know, it's okay to move forward. But I like when they allow Jake to be the one who's more emotionally advanced, right? He they and and kind of help his dad in a, in a in a moment like that. I thought it was great. I, I thought it was well acted. I thought I thought it was beautiful, in fact. And I thought it is where the heart and and warm nuggety center of the episode could have been, should have been, and thought it mm-hmm. was going to be. And I actually kind of in the moment convinced myself that that's what it was. And I think that my current emotional state is quite a part of that. But upon further discussion and review, of course, I watched it literally an hour before we talked about it. So, <laughs> right, uh, it 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 never lives up to that scene, unfortunately. So it's it's both the best scene, favorite scene of mine, and also I think the Achilles heel of the episode because it 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 holds itself up to a mirror that it and there's no reflection. Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree with you. For me, like it's de- it's definitely that first scene. It's definitely just sort of telling him about the nightmare and him being a good father and and again, setting up a much superior episode to what we got. And uh, but I thought the performances were great. I thought the writing was good. Like, and that's and that was sort of the frustrating part about it, is like the writers of this clearly are talented writers. They just didn't they did another I there's a at the BMI writers workshop that would frequently use the phrase like you need, you need this is another you need another pot of coffee mm. on this. You know, have, take, take a pot of coffee, do a rewrite on this, and then come back together. And that's that's really what this needed. There was an episode here to be made. They just didn't make it. So let's hand out some self-sealing stem bolts. You know, that all said, the performances actually save it here quite a bit. I thought that Avery Brooks, I, you, man... It was, we were texting last night and it was we were joking. I said, I hate when you're right about stuff. And <laughs> you know, you'll you'll recall that the pilot, the first two episodes, I was not sold on Avery Brooks as an as a in this role. I just thought his kind of weird line reads and his weird physicality and 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 choices, but that quirk lends such a unique dimension to the character that you don't get you know it's funny i've been watching a lot of uh law and order and some other just like prime time network television right now and you just get a lot of sheen and stock yeah and every brooks is neither of those things it is very raw in some ways it is very kind of just do whatever take it is go with it and and it's and grounded is not what i would say but it feels lived in which is a weird juxtaposition, but it's mm-hmm. the way I'm, I'm reading it. 
And he's going through those feels. And there's something about, you know, he's been such a great leader over the past few episodes. In fact, he hasn't been in a lot of the recent episodes, but he's shown to be a really great leader. He's shown to be a, 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 a developing father. And this episode gives him a chance to sort of do something different and explore some other emotional stuff. Now, is it is it truncated? Yes. Is it end up being a little silly in some ways? Yes. But it felt real, and it felt like he, you know, that first episode with Jennifer and even the beginning of this episode, it felt like he was trapped in that past. And seeing him able to just kind of have some joy and have some fun, I really appreciated that. So there, it's not all bad for me. I liked that. I liked the stuff with Jake. I loved the scene with him and Dax, where Dax is kind of like, you know what? There's a little bit of that curse on us still here. I'm a horn, I'm a hornball. I'm sort of a sleazy hornball in some ways, but I'm also your buddy and I want you to be here for me. I like that maybe maybe unbeknownst to them, they 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 showed a little bit of Ben's good personal relationships with all his crew. They all know something's up. They all can read it on him. Uh, so clearly he's he's gotten close with them. So it's there's some movement forward in the episode that I liked. I thought the shots of the ship, of the planets, there were some great uh, effects. There's some great shots in this episode. I thought the performance of uh, the 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 guest star, what's her name? Uh, uh, her name is uh, Sally Elise Richardson. I thought she was great. I thought she was excellent. Unfortunately, not a lot of meat on the bone, but I think that there's enough there that it was a, I had a fun time with the watch and I, you know, uh, without, <laughs> if, with, before really exploring it, well, I liked it. It was pretty good. So I, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I'm just killing your joy. So uh, it's not in the upper echelon, but I'd, I'd give it a 73 stem bolts. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really wish that it were the episode that you described. Um, you know, I, I think I think for all the reasons that I've already outlined, I need to like just repeat myself. Um, I just think it doesn't hold the, the the mystery of it doesn't hold up, the logic of it doesn't hold up. I liked the idea of the obnoxious terraformer, and I thought all that worked. I thought the um terraforming a star that was cool i would have liked to have seen more with that and it ended up being like totally just a, a, a MacGuffin. it was just sort of there um you know i i visually liked it i thought the effects were great um but you know the reality of it for me is it just does not serve cisco well it yeah. serves him well as a father but his behavior throughout this whole thing with this woman doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, and I, I, I sort of like tease that she's just sort of like a horny avatar who's sort of brainless. Yeah, but like he didn't... So so we're to think that they were together for hours and hours and he either didn't ask her anything about herself <laughs> that entire time or like was perfectly happy with like, I don't know, yeah. Like, where are you from? What do you do? Tell me about your folks. Tell me, like, I don't know. And, and, it, it, and, and then, like, going to the cops to, like, stalk her. It's just, it, the whole thing was weird. It's a little weird. And, and the whole thing was just, like, and then he's, he makes out with her when he already knows that she's kind of the wife of this guy. I, I don't, it's just not good. It's just not good. And it's just not a, there's not enough interesting stuff there to make up for the, just like, what is this? I, I feel like it's 45 minutes of my life. I didn't really, I I gained about eight minutes of useful stuff. And then the rest of it was sort of a waste of time. Um, really like the Jake stuff, but you don't, uh, sorry, you don't get any more than 39 self-sealing 39? Stem bolts. Well, I'm, I'm going back and looking at our ratings from stuff. And uh, that's not even, that's, there, there were, one, two, three, four episodes below that in season one. So it just wasn't, it, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for me. I, I don't, I, now that I've dissected it at this level, I don't know if I need to see this one again. So, uh, so there we go. Wow, that, that average, is, that does not help the average. Let's say that. Does not, it does not help the average at all. Um, but if you're keeping track at home, right, our season average for season two thus far, me, I'm at a 74, 
You were at a 79. Both of them up from season one. So uh, coming up next week, we are going to discuss Sanctuary. So uh, keep up here. We'll see you on Wednesday with the next episode of Deep Space Nine. Uh, check out, look at my Star Trek toys and our new show, k and Geekly, where we discuss all things geek, both of them in your feed. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash K and M. Get all sorts of fun stuff. I promise it's fun. Mike, any final thoughts? No, Keith. Thanks to everybody joining us. Thanks for everybody uh, on our Patreon feed who watches me watch the show. It's fun hanging out with y'all. Uh, we'll see you next week. I'm looking forward to uh, that crazy r- romance that I was promised, Keith, because I sure didn't get it this week. No, indeed. Till then, folks. This has been Keith and Mike. Watch Deep Space Nine. Thank you for watching KME Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe.